Good day, Mel Moriah and guests. We welcome you to the sanctuary of Mel Moriah Baptist Church for today's Bible study. Thank you for choosing us as the place in which you will study today. Today we are continuing our series of conversations from the book of Proverbs, specifically Proverbs chapter 25, verses 15 through 28. Proverbs chapter 25, verses 15 through 28 from the New International Version. It reads this way. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. If you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will vomit. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, too much of you, and they will hate you. Like a club or sword or a sharp arrow is one who gives false testimony against a neighbor. Like a broken tooth or a lame foot is reliance on the unfaithful in a time of trouble. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will reap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Like a north wind that brings unexpected rain is a sly tongue which provokes a horrified look. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. Like a muddied spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. It is not good to eat too much honey, nor is it honorable to search out matters that are too deep. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Amen. That's Proverbs 25, verses 15 through 28. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to come today to study your word. And as we study, we ask and pray that you would just be the ultimate teacher and that you would change our hearts and our minds so that we might be more faithful to the Proverbs you have given unto us. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Remember that we are in this second section of a collection of sayings from King Solomon. Uh, King Solomon is broken down into five parts. The first part is chapter 1 through chapter 9, in which we have parental sayings where a mother or father is speaking to his or her son or sons, and giving them parental advice as they are about to leave the home for the first time. They have reached adulthood. The second section is a section that it starts at chapter 10 and moves all the way to the end of chapter 24, and that is called the first collection of sayings by King Solomon. We do not believe uh, that they were written by uh, King Solomon. We do um, believe, however, uh, that they display the same wisdom that King Solomon himself displayed. And so now we are concluding the first chapter in the second a collection of songs or sayings attributed to King Solomon, specifically Proverbs 25, verse 1, all the way down um, to 29, verse 7. These are said to be more Proverbs of Solomon um, compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We do believe that these sayings are compiled by Hezekiah, the king of Judah, who served from about 720 BCE to about 700 BCE. Uh, these again um, 
uh, not written by Hezekiah, but we do believe that they were collected uh, by Hezekiah. Remember, again, that the book of Proverbs is a book that teaches us what wisdom looks like and the results of wisdom. It also compares and contrasts wisdom with foolishness, the results of foolishness, and what foolish people do, what they look like. So wisdom produces blessings, which gives us life, which gives us eternal life. Foolishness or folly leads to destruction. Destruction leads to death. And death leads to eternal damnation. So keep that in mind. These Proverbs basically teach us how we are to live. How we are to live our lives. How we are to act in society. And if we live by these Proverbs, then society will be a better place and we will be honored and respected in the society. So keep all of that in mind as we study these verses today. So let's dig into this. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Keep in mind that the king is God's representative. The king is to display the characteristics of God. The king is to impart justice and righteousness in the kingdom. So we return now to one's relations to a ruler. The, the ruler is the human who is superior over all other humans. And so we're talking about the sort of behavior that will move a king or ruler favorably. Patience is a variant of what we have seen in the book of Proverbs for or of slow to anger. So slow to anger means sort of or a variant of patience. Now look at this, the softest organ, the tongue, breaks the hardest organ, the bone. And so what the proverb is, is basically saying that, you know, you can persuade a ruler, you can persuade a person with a gentle tongue, with, with patience, with being slow to anger. And patience and a gentle tongue is so powerful that it can break a bone. The bone, again, being the hardest organ. In today's society, goes something like this. The pen is mightier than the sword. So patience is what we must practice and our words must be gentle. Verses 16 and 17 warn against good social relationships going bad. It says, if you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will vomit. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, too much of you, and they will hate you. These verses basically talk about setting parameters or having limits. And if you have parameters and, you, and if you set limits, then everything is good. But when you go past those parameters and exceed those limits, then social relations can go from good to bad. Think about this whole notion of honey. You have honey, just the right amount of honey to season food or to season tea or to even eat is good for you. Too much of it, you will vomit. Too much of it will uh, make your food not taste good to you. Too much of it 
will not suit your taste when you're drinking tea. So you have to have the right amount of honey. And so, um, again, finding honey and stuffing yourself with too much honey is compared here to presenting oneself again and again at your neighbor's door. Again, both are failures to uh, limit behaviors uh, that might be perfectly good in themselves. What I'm saying is honey within itself is good. Visiting your neighbor within itself is good. But, but too much of it can be bad. Too much honey can make you sick. Visiting your neighbor or knocking at your neighbor's door too much can wear out your welcome. And it also teaches us against this whole notion of too much of. Too much of can be a bad thing, but just the proper limits or just enough can be, can be a good thing. So I think that that's basically um, the lesson learned. Too much of can be bad. Just the right amount can be good. Verse 18 goes back uh, to this whole notion of a false witness. Like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow is one who gives false testimony against a neighbor. Now think about this whole notion of a court case and a false witness and in a court case can initiate the judicial process. It can be, the false witness can be an accuser who initiates the judicial process or after it has begun this false witness can testify in court. And here we have weapons that can be used or that can do damage when used with deadly force. A club or a sword or a sharp arrow can do much damage. It has deadly force. And the same thing with a, with a false witness. A false witness can do much damage. So the weapon is an imagery for the deadly force of lying words. We have to be careful what we say. As I said last week, and we have to be people of truth. People who do not lie. People who do not make up things. People who do not gossip but people who always relay the truth. Here we have another proverb in verse 19 that basically says the same thing. Like a broken tooth or a lame foot is reliance on the faithful in the time of trouble. A broken tooth, you can't, you can't depend upon it. This foot that the verse talks about that is lame is a foot that shakes or slips. And the one who has this foot that shakes or slips really cannot depend upon it. And we are reliable and dependable on our body parts. And a healthy society is dependent upon those who are in it. A healthy society is not one that only depends upon certain people or people who are, who are dependent upon themselves. A healthy society is one in which persons are dependent upon one another. And so therefore, in times of crisis, when things are not going well in community, 
community depends on one another. So if community depends upon one another, then everyone in the community must be faithful in time of trouble. But the unfaithful are those that you cannot rely upon in times of trouble, just as though you cannot depend upon that broken foot or that lame foot or that broken tooth. So again, society needs each other. Society needs everyone to be faithful to that society. And therefore, in times of need, <coughs> society will be able to rely on one another. That can be your neighborhood, that can be your town, that can be your city, uh, that can be your church, uh, that can be your fraternity, sorority, uh, that can be your partners you hang out with, the girls you hang out with, that can be uh, a small group, but the same thing applies. Verse 20, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Nobody in their right mind on a cold day would throw away their garments. No one will leave their body to be exposed on a cold day. Nor would anyone pour acid vinegar on a wound. Wounds in biblical times were washed with oil or balm. So pain shows the damage done by the inappropriate levity to a sad or heavy heart. When you see a, a sad or heavy heart, that means that pain has, has done some damage. There is some pain that is there. And that pain has done damage. That wound has been opened. That person's garment has been taken away. So we have to be compassionate and empathetic uh, to a person with a heavy heart. <coughs> Verses 21 and 22 are very familiar to us. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Again, this verse tells us that we are to love everybody. We not only are to love our neighbor, we're not only to love the stranger, but we are also to love the enemy. If they're hungry, we are to feed them. Neighbor, stranger, enemy. If they're thirsty, neighbor, stranger, enemy. We are to give them water. This whole notion of heaping burning coals on his head is God's punishment to a sinner. And so when you look out for someone who is hungry or in need, what you do, especially when it comes to your enemy, it is in a very peculiar way God's punishment upon them. Because what they see is the love of God given to them by their enemy. So it will, it will be punishment to your enemy. But when you do this, it will be a reward to you. So this fiery coals can also represent the red face shame of your enemy in response to your kindness. The reality is that, is that we must always be concerned with overcoming evil with God, with good, I'm sorry. And God takes note 
of what we do. God takes note of when we do wrong, and God takes note of when we do good. And so, therefore, we ought to do good at all times. Verses 23 and 24 concern bad relations. Like a north wind that brings unexpected rain is a sly tongue which provokes a horrified look. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. We see bad weather in verse 23. We see the husband on the roof exposed to the weather in verse 24. The problem with verse 23 is that normally rain generally does not come from the north. So a north wind can also be read as a hidden wind. The sly tongue that it talks about is, is a secret tongue. And the point is, is that rain or emotional storms can rise from unexpected sources. So emotional storms can rise from hidden sources, unexpected sources, or even secret sources. And we have, to, we have to be very aware of that. Verse 24, better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. We see verse 4 numerous times in minor variations from the book of Proverbs. And... I read where uh, Socrates, his wife gave him a scolding, and after she gave him a scolding, she uh, doused him with water. And Socrates remarked that after the thunder comes the rain. And so what it says is that the exposure uh, to elements was considered to be better exposure than to deal with uh, a wife whose temper is off the hook. And this is not necessarily a bad thing because we see, and we will see at the end of Proverbs, uh, that the remarks about a quarrelsome wife is tempered by the persuasive affirmation of wife as wisdom. So it does tell us that having a wife is a statement of wisdom and a wife is one of wisdom, but it also tells us that there can be times in which uh, things in that relationship is, is, not, is not right. And it's better to step away, use that patience that we just talked about, and then when things cool down, come back and talk about it. Verse 25 and 26, like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. Like a muddied spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. Like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. Like a muddy spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. We see verses 25 and 26 linked by water images, one positive, one negative. Remember, both are presumed by the hot and arid or dry land or dry climate of P Palestine. And drinking water in this hot and dry climate of, of Palestine was very, very precious. It was a life-saving commodity. And so good news from far away is like water that restores a person who is worn out by thirst. So good news 
is good on any day. It restores our soul. It gives us water to quench our thirst. And then we have this notion in verse uh, 26 of a muddy spring and a polluted well. A muddy spring and a polluted well, they're no good. Can't drink water from them. And in like vein, a righteous person who has given way to the wicked is no good as well. So it lets us know that there are times in which the righteous do give way to the wicked. And there are times when the wicked or the guilty succeed at the expense of the righteous or the innocent. And the reality is <clears throat> that there are times in life when things just don't work out justly. Let me just say a little bit more about this. We have an image of cattle that trample and be foul a water in place so that no one can drink from it. Something that is good has essentially been ruined. And in the same way, there are times when the spiritual and the social waters necessary for communal well-being are polluted and undrinkable. And without justice, both divine and human, the fountains of life are always corrupt. That's why we have to practice justice and righteousness. And that's why God is the ultimate judge. In verse 27, it is not good to eat too much honey, nor is it honorable to search out matters that are too, too deep. Not good to eat too much honey, and it is not good to seek glory for oneself or to search for one's glory. Verse 28 Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self control. Again, wisdom is superior to strength. Lack of self control leaves one exposed and without defense. So we need to practice self-control at all times. That ends our study. So let's look at what, what Jesus says about all of this. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, uh, beginning at verse 35. Well, let me start at verse 34. These are the words of Jesus. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous, righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did it for me. So again, uh, we are compelled by Christ to give the hungry something to eat, to give the thirsty something to drink, to invite the stranger in, to clothe the naked, to look after the sick, and to visit those who are in prison. And if we do this, 
to our neighbor, to the stranger, to our enemy, then we have done it unto Christ. That ends our session today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study. We thank you for being in our mess and we ask and pray that you help us to apply these proverbs to our lives. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen.